I call it having a, a, a good balance between discipline in your organization and compassion. And centered around that is knowing the men and women within your span of control. And there could be some nonverbal cues from the men and women within a leader's uh, span of control that would show that potentially something uh, is not going right in their organization. Leaders have to be cognizant of that at all level. And commanders and senior enlisted leaders have to set an environment that allows for junior enlisted uh, folks especially to have a voice. This goes back to what I talked about, the, the balance between discipline and compassion. Right. So they have to understand what is expected of them as a, a new trooper in the organization. And then they have to understand what leaders are going to do to help them set up and be successful. This goes back to the, rece the reception and uh, integration of new personnel in the organization. And if we get that right on the front end, that E1 to E4, that most vulnerable population, um, will continue to thrive in that kind of environment and grow. And then they will understand that they're empowered, uh, that if something is not right in the organization or something is not right with them or something has happened to them, that they understand that they can freely bring that up as an issue. Whether it's at the lowest tactical level to the highest levels of command, there is no substitute for engaged, caring leadership that can pick up on nonverbal cues in their service members that something may not be right or that they're not afraid to enforce a standard of behavior on members of the organization when it is counter to the values that you know, we uh, have in the Department of Defense. A, a command climate that is healthy uh, means that everybody is treated with dignity and respect, that there are appropriate lines of separation between leaders and the ones they lead. Sometimes where the breakdown of discipline happens is when there's a blurred line between leaders and the folks that they are charged to lead meaning leaders all of a sudden are more worried about being popular than being trusted and respected. And when that line kind of breaks down and there's a blurred line between the leader and led, that can lead to instances where sexual assault could thrive. You have to care. I call it caring about, I've got three fully grown sons and I've got four grandchildren. And I try to treat every service member that I encounter in the DOD the way I treat my sons and my grandchildren because I want to treat them with the same dignity and respect that I give my siblings or excuse me my kids and my grandkids so um, when we have leaders like that that are, have that kind of compassion but they also are enforcing the discipline in the organization you're gonna have a pretty good organization out there where there's very little opportunity for sexual assault or sexual harassment to fester and grow. You know, as a leader, whether it's at the lowest tactical level or wherever, minding your business is not allowed. As a leader, you have a responsibility to be engaged with your service members. So when a leader tries to mind their own business, when there might be something going on uh, that uh, is kind of a nonverbal cue or some overt act, you know, of that. Uh, may not be healthy for the organization. If that leader isn't enforcing it, they just reinforce that kind of behavior. Some cases, leaders try to be transactional in their nature, meaning you come to work, you show up on time, you do the work expected of you, you go home. So it's kind of, hey, if you do the job every day, I'll make sure you go home on time. When <clears throat> a leader like that, that is transactional, uh, may not be promoting the trust and respect that the service members or the, the span of control his team should have for him. That leader has to be transformational. That means they have to be inspirational. They've got to provide purpose, motivation, direction, and they've got to use their example, what they do more so than what they say, to show what right looks like in the organization. When we have leaders that stand in front of a group of people and are continually barking orders uh, but not showing the proper example, 
we're never going to have the effect that we need on a cohesive organization that's built on mutual trust and respect and that understands, well, the leader's doing this. I know I got to do this too. I always say that discipline and compassion are a scale, you know, and that they have to be balanced. A toxic leader that is, you know, being hard, beyond hard on discipline, you know, and, and discipline is weighing down compassion. In this area right here is where things like sexual assault will fester. It goes the other way too. For a leader that is kind of hands off and is very compassionate and discipline is being able to lag and compassion is weighing down discipline, this vacuum here will allow for the same thing. There has to be that healthy uh, climate there. I think in an organization there has to be healthy fear. And whenever you use the word fear, people automatically think, oh, you're being toxic. Healthy fear means if you're my boss, I res respect and trust you so much that I don't want to let you down. It will hurt my feelings more if you tell me I'm disappointed in you than whatever kind of non-judicial punishment or anything you could do on me if I screw up. And that kind of uh, climate is built on that inspirational, transformational leader who builds into their subordinates this trust and respect and this climate of dignity and, you know, we're one team. And if something is not right, I expect you, E2 Troxel, to speak up. I've been in this institution since I was 18 years old. I'm 55 now. Uh, I've been on active duty for 37 years. And I am the product. I've made it this far as the SEAC because of good leadership and engaged leadership that even as a young private in 1982, you know, the majority of my NCOs were Vietnam veterans, but they were the ones that were shaping me to be that leader of presence and character and, and that person that served in the military and could be an example for our nation. And so I never forgot about that as I grew up. And so at every level, I thought, I got to be a leader that leads by example. And I've got to be able to do the things that I expect the men and women that are in my charge. So I've always tried to make it an environment, wherever I've been at, that it's built on camaraderie. It's built on providing inspirational direction and motivating people. I've always tried to be that person that leads by example and that when I get up in the morning and when I go to bed at night, I'm figuring out how can I get better tomorrow. Even at almost 56 years old and been 37 plus years in this institution, I've got to look for ways to get better, to be a better leader, to be a better example. And I think that starts with what I really try to be and that's just be the best husband, father and grandfather I can be. I've been married to my wife for 36 years. And she's been all over the world with me, and, uh, and she is my soulmate, my best friend, my ranger buddy. And every day, we look for ways to make our marriage better. And we look for ways to be better parents to our three sons and their wives, and certainly to our four grandchildren.